three, two, one, and we are live on the Metabolic Motivation Show today with uh, Dr. Mark Bubbs, uh, who is in Canada, and uh, Dr. Bubbs is a natru naturopathic doctor, and he's also the sports nutrition lead for the Canadian Olympic team. Uh, so, uh, Mark, thanks so much uh, for, for making time for us today. Uh, I know you're a busy guy. You've got a new book out, uh, you're, which you're promoting. You've got your private practice there uh, in Canada. And um, so how's everything today? Everything's great, Dan. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, just got back from New York uh, on Monday promoting the book there, speaking at a conference, fitness conference out that way. So, uh, yeah, nice to, be, uh, nice to be back home. Wonderful. Well, you know, I bet people are would love to to hear about your book. Can you t you know tell us tell us the the brief, uh, you know, the brief version of your of a couple of highlights maybe I guess would be. For sure, yeah. The book is called uh, the Paleo Project, and it really stems from, you know, what I see in clinical practice and sort of the benefits that people have gotten both on the just health and wellness side, which I see a lot of patients on that side, and also on the athletic side because I work with a lot of you know higher end athletes. So it's this idea of because the paleo diet is such a good foundation, what I found is that for some people who just couldn't adhere or the buy-in was too great in terms of restrictions, if we, if we just use that paleo diet as a foundation, right? Because the very word paleo just means eating more real food, right? And yeah. cutting down process and, and simple stuff. If we use that as a foundation, from there we can really build up um, the personalized approach for, for whatever meets that person's goals, right? Whether it's look good, feel good, or whether it's in terms of personal bests, in terms of lifts or 10K runs, et cetera, right? Yeah, fascinating stuff. Yeah, that's uh, really that's you're describing kind of exactly what uh, what I do with my own practice. But I think you've said it more eloqu eloquently than than I have. So I'm going to take some notes from your description. Nice. So yeah, I love that as a platform, and uh, I, oft I oftentimes tell people, hey. You know, I, I think we should take the best of the, um, you know, the best of, uh, you know, the vegetarian or vegan world and the best of paleo and sort of really merge them. Just a lot of vegetables, but still having animal protein um, for most people, I find works well. And, uh, and then having a lot of healthy fat and, uh, you know, clean sources of, uh, of real food. And uh, it's really not that complicated, is it? That's one of the things. I mean, a, a lot of the myths that we had, even around you know animal protein consumption, is one of the, the stumbling blocks. And I think that's why, with the research coming out and, and and paleo becoming popular at the same time, is this idea that yeah, meat, animal protein is very nutrient dense. It's the most nutrient dense food, and it's not you know the culprit that we thought it was for these you know dangerous levels of high cholesterol or saturated fat intakes, and how those things can you know traditionally we thought that they might have led to. Um, cardiovascular complications, etc. But the research is really clear now that it doesn't do that. And in fact, the excessive carbohydrate consumption, a recent study out in November in Plus One showed they actually increased stepwise the carbohydrate intake in uh, patients who were somewhat overweight. Uh, and that was the direct cause of increasing those plasma levels of saturated fats, which are the bad ones. So it's amazing how we still um, the traditional community tell people to avoid the eggs and uh, you know eat the mueslis and the cereals for breakfast, but that's actually uh, from what the research tells us is kind of the wrong approach. Yeah, it, it is fascinating. I mean, if you go back, there's the whole um, you know I don't I don't really like to get into the whole conspiracy theory or whatever, but uh, but you know science is um, is something that can be very poli you know politicized, and there's a lot of egos in just like in the rest of life. I mean, it's not uh, you know. Uh, I think that I think the average layperson thinks that you know sci the scientific world is totally black and white, and what they don't understand, um, and what the media doesn't really go into, is uh, that there's you know just thousands and thousands of different uh, people out there doing studies, and some of those are funded by special interest groups who want a certain result, and some are not, and uh, you know, and oftentimes what gets in the press just happens by chance. Yeah, and it's all about kind of triggering a bit of a response, isn't it? Because as sure. much as now, I mean, the, the tidal wave of, of, of momentum for people realizing that butter is not bad for you and that these cholesterols and saturated fats aren't an issue, but we recently just had here in our national newspaper in Canada um, an article about how people who ate more than two eggs, and this was an observational study, which becomes really important because it, you know, the article actually promotes the fact that if, when the people ate more than two eggs, they were at 69% increased risk of cardiovascular disease. 
course, what it doesn't tell you is that this is just an observational study. So yes. there's no, no causation at all. I mean, those people could have been eating. And likely, you know, here in Canada, they call it a lumberjack breakfast. So when you have more than two eggs, it normally comes with pancakes and, and uh, toast and a whole bunch of potatoes and everything else. So it doesn't tell you anything about all the other factors um, oh, yeah. in that person's life. So, so again, it just it's tough for that average person who now is starting to buy into the fact that, okay, I should be eating these you know, these meats and eggs and stuff like that. Now they see this article and again, it's, it's, they're sort of back to square one. So I think that's where a lot of, you know, it's great with podcasts and stuff that people can try to even find reliable sources of info because, you know, like you're saying, there's lots of info out there now, but it also almost becomes a little bit confusing for people, right? Because there's so many arguments in, in different directions. Yeah, no question. Uh, I was on, an, I was doing an interview myself a couple of days ago with uh, Wendy Myers, who's down in, uh, down in Texas and um, so she asked me, uh, you know, what I felt like was the biggest uh, uh, obstacle that, uh, that people were facing. And, uh, you know, there's, there's tons of things you could say, right? I mean, I, and, I, and it just occurred to me, though, in the spur of the moment that it was confusion, that there's so yeah. much information. There's an information. There's an overload of information. And, uh, and it's uh, so easy to be confused by all the conflicting data. And uh, and so you know, as you were saying, it's it's that's why it's so incumbent to uh, you know to find people who are um, you know who are not just uh, not just you know have who have their qualifications, of course, but also you know use common sense. You know, I can one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show is I looked at you know I looked at your web. I could see that you have a great knowledge base. Number one. I could see that you were working, you know, obviously you have the credibility of working with uh, the Canadian Olympic team and, uh, you know, they're not going to work with you if you don't know your stuff. Uh, and so that was number two. And then number three, I could see, you know, looking at your, pic at your pictures there, I could say, hey, man, this is a guy who's in shape. You know, he's, he looks healthy. And um, how many times do, uh, do we, if we go to our health care system, I've, we've got a family member who's, who's having some health issues, uh, my, my wife's family, and my God, the, the most unhealthy people I've seen in years because I are in the hospital. I mean, working in the hospital. You know, it's really sad. I don't mean to knock them because I know they're many of them For are sure. trying to do. Yeah. They're trying to help people, but uh, gosh, you know, it's a it's it's an, an environment that's I don't know. <laughs> it's tricky. I mean, yeah. This weekend again, I was in New York promoting the book, doing a few talks, and that comes up so often in terms of this just this idea of. Of, of you know our healthcare practitioners being a bit more congruent with you know kind of practicing what they preach or, or really being into the healthy living and being active and things like that um, and like you said that the solutions aren't really as complex as they need to be I mean just the minimum amount of exercise of walking um, you know if you're starting out some body weight squats or, or some movements like that or on the food side you know just starting with your first meal of the day if people are struggling with with poor health or being overweight you know we just start with that breakfast meal and get that adjusted and let them, you know, not even worry about the other meals to start with. And that way, you know, you can kind of slowly start influencing behaviors because, um, like you said, it's a lot, it's easy to tell somebody what to do, but to actually get them to change their behavior yes. and start making the eggs and the kale and everything else in the morning. Now, that's the real, that's the real trick, right? Yes. Yeah. The behavior modification is something I've really um, kind of focused on uh, more so than, and, uh, and you know, the, the psychology of change uh, and I've been focusing a bit on uh, some of the work out of the University of Pennsylvania, the, the positive psychology studies that they're doing. And uh, because I think that that area is, um, you know, I think when you get down to it, it's, it's not as it's, it's there's a lot of simple things that we know are highly effective and uh, can have a great impact. But uh, but, yeah, implementation, that's the, the issue. Sure. And I like what's your idea would focus on. So so you're I would that was one of my questions, in fact. So you're. Your plan for implementation would would that how would you start? Uh, as you mentioned, would that be your typical start? Just start with breakfast. Yeah, I mean it depends on the, on the patient, but I mean even in the in the book we describe the first sections: the proteins, the carbs, and the fats, and we give people some general benchmarks of of things that they should be trying to achieve. Um, and I always say just just aim for one or two things at a time, and once that becomes you know easy and a habit and something that the person doesn't have to in the morning say, oh, i got to remember to eat this much protein or to consume this much in a meal. It just becomes something they do day to day. Then it's easier to, to move on to the next thing, whether it's the fats or the carbohydrates, etc. right? So if we can go in that kind of stepwise approach, then people, it sort of integrates into the routine in such a subtle way that, you know, it doesn't become overwhelming. So if you find sometimes even the best plan in the world, if you give people too many things to do after four weeks and the motivation starts to wane and all of a sudden they say, well, 
I'm going to do nothing then, right? It's an all or nothing approach for us. Normally, if we can just titrate, titrate that in slowly and just get people to buy in piece by piece, they start feeling better, you know, they start looking better, and all of a sudden, you know, they're the ones driving the changes of wanting to, you know, get to that next, changing the lunch meal or, or getting to the next positive change, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's very, you know, that, that lines up perfectly with all the, uh, with, you know, the, 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 what the studies are showing in uh, behavioral change psychology, and, and uh, so that's wonderful stuff. Um, I have to remember that, you know, from my, from my own background, I think you and I both, you know, were, grew up as sort of athletes. Uh, I, I, as a mediocre <laughs> athlete, but as a, uh, as a, as a, you know, someone who tried hard. And, uh, and so I, nice. can, so I have to remember that a lot of times people, some people don't, you know, don't enjoy, I think athletes oftentimes I find it easier to work with because they're willing to, you know, you I had a guy tell me, you know, I, you know, you want me to eat? If I can get faster, this was a uh, a soccer, a young soccer player here in Spain, and he said, you know, if I can get faster, I'll eat rocks because yeah, he, uh, that, yeah. he he knows that uh, his only liability is um, is his speed, and he he can potentially make millions of dollars uh, if he gets. Uh, but he's had a lot of injuries, and he's got a little bit of a he's had weight issues, and uh, he's starting to uh, he's starting to buy in now. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the thing, too. I mean, we talk about that idea of, you know, performance being sort of a different avenue as well. I mean, you know, that look good, feel good is one side, but then as we get into performance, it's a little bit different in that sense of <clears throat> people have different benchmarks that we're trying to achieve, and even people who are really already bought into, you know, the a paleo, say, lifestyle, or again, a lot of the CrossFit crowd, um, when I give talks to, the, to those communities, um, there's a lot of things in that performance realm in terms of, you know, achieving you know, if you're looking for performance or adding lean mass, achieving your total caloric intake um, or the amount of macros that you need to hit is pretty important. Um, and it's funny because if people are trying to lose weight or, or improve their body composition, fat loss, I never count calories. Yes. You never count calories. But if we're trying to add lean mass to an athlete, that's when we got to make sure there's enough energy in the system to, to be able to help support that lean mass, right? Right. Uh, and that's sometimes we're on that carbohydrate side. We can see some people... Because a paleo diet does lend itself really well to a low carb diet, it's great for the people who want to lose weight, look good, feel good. But it doesn't necessarily; it's not mutually exclusive that it has to be a low carb diet. We we got to get those carbs in there for those higher performers um, to really achieve their 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 optimal performance, right? Yeah. Now, what what when you are recommending carbs to your athletes or or to clients, which uh, what type of carbs carbs do you uh, do you find work well? Yeah, I mean, we're always trying to start with, you know, the roots and tubers and things like that. So, uh, you know, for people with the breakfast, you know, the plantains work really well and the, the root vegetables like the yuccas and the sweet potatoes and things like that. Um, when people struggle to get enough in with that or if, if just preparation becomes an issue, that's where some of the grasses like, you know, the quinoas and the buckwheats, which, you know, can be thrown in there. But with my approach and kind of this modern paleo approach, this is where we just we bend the rules a little bit and that's maybe that kind of 80-20 rule of, of things like, you know, rice or other gluten-free carbs yes. that I would, I would include if the person doesn't have any digestive issues, if they don't have any immune issues, if the food is not causing them any adverse reactions, um, and we need to get those carbohydrates in and they're nutrient-dense, then I think that's where, that's where we do it. We tend to see some really good results overall. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that certainly lines up with my own experience, you know, uh, yeah, also. And, uh, so, um, what about um, what about healthy fats? What are the what kind of fat sources do you find uh, work well? I mean, this is one like you said with that conversation around you know myths and saturated fats, etc. I mean, we're always trying to educate people that you know these saturated fats are pretty crucial for overall health. I mean, it's 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 great on a, even a weight loss or, or improve your health side of things because we can use them for fuels, right? They're short chain fats; they get absorbed you know right away into the gut. You know, versus those longer fats that need to be sent to the liver and, and broken up, etc. So, getting people to do a little bit of cooking with butter or adding butter, you know, to veggies. And often in clinical practice, we'll find that people actually have a, a little reaction to butter. You know, that casein protein they might not realize, but all of a sudden they start reacting to a little bit, and that's where we can move to things like the clarified butters, uh, the ghees to help with that, as well as uh, coconut oil. Um, adding that to shakes, even using it as a spread. Some people like it. You know, have a piece of fruit. Put a little bit of coconut oil on it, and it's a nice, uh, tasty treat. Um, although, if you don't want your eggs to taste like coconuts, then you got to find another option there. In yeah, the morning. yeah, I did some eggs with uh, with with some grass fed butter uh, just a couple, a few hours ago, and, uh, and then served that with awesome. some 
with some kale and a, uh, what the Spaniards called sofrito, which is a uh, saute, sort of just a, a saute of, uh, with some garlic and some onions and uh, a little bit of parsley. And uh, wonderful amazing. stuff. Wonderful it's stuff. It's amazing, too, how once you get into that rhythm, I imagine it probably doesn't even take you that long to cook something like that. No, you know, it's Something that's quick. Now. And that's the thing. And when people just start, they always think, oh, it's going to take me quite a while or, you know, I'm busy in the morning. But you realize once you get rolling with it, you know, five, six, eight minutes and it's, uh, you know, it's all prepped up, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, you can one thing I even suggest to people if they're if they are, you know, extremely busy during the week, as many people are, is, uh, you know, spend some time on Sunday night just doing, you know, uh, either one one plan is actually cooking multiple meals and freezing things, which you know, yeah. which can be, it takes and is an effort, but it is the, you know, it does pay off. Or the other is just simply taking time to, uh, to, to do the prep, you know, and I got this from working yeah. in restaurants in university as, you know, like many people, <laughs> you know, I was the, started oh, yeah. off as the, uh, as the prep guy. And so, uh, cut up, um, you know, a few kilos of, uh, of onions and have them already done. And it's that one, one less step. Oh, for sure. And I mean, I, uh, you know, obviously, you're living in Europe. I lived in the south of France for a year and worked in a restaurant there after university. And I was amazed at you know the different focus on foods because after our shift there, we would actually break and then with the chefs, we would eat lunch, like a real proper oh, lunch, yeah. the same foods that the guests were eating. Um, and I was blown away because having worked in North America in a restaurant, I no definitely way. wasn't eating lunch with the chef afterwards. So it was kind of a cool take on just how important food is um, you know, over there. Um, which is great because that th those things are, are kind of coming now more in North America, but it's really it's really valuable. You can see it in terms of overall health over there as well, right? Oh yeah, yeah, no question. In fact, you you, you oftentimes see that um, that tradition as well with the restaurants here. That uh, you, I'll notice the uh, the staffs in the restaurants either um, oftentimes eating. You know, it, lunch is already very late. Spain's on this alternative time, <laughs> alternative yeah. world. You know, lunch is after two p.m. and can can drag on until four, and uh, and then that's usually the main meal. And then um, uh, you might, uh, if you're working for the government, you don't even go back to work. You're done, you know. And uh, so, uh, but uh, yeah, it's 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 a different lifestyle, no no question. So, yeah, I mean over here as well, we're so uh, you know that twenty four seven kind of society in North America where it's sort of go go go. It's nice to see that juxtaposition in Spain because you know people get worn out. They not enough sleep and long days and going from the office to the kids and that constant connectivity. So that's one of the, the pictures that we tend to see, you know, in clinical practice is that sort of sympathetic nervous system overdrive and, and people getting run down and fatigues and anxieties and low moods and things like that. Um, so it's, it's pretty amazing. Some of the stuff that's coming out even around breathing, you know, deep breathing, activation of the vagus nerve. We talk about that. There's a whole chapter on, on cortisol in the, in the paleo project. And it's amazing how, such a simple technique, and there's a lot of really robust studies coming out, but such a simple technique is just taking some deep breaths, some deep belly breaths can really activate those pathways that help you know, recharge the body and sort of build up that candle that we're burning at both ends here, right? Yeah, I love that analogy. Yeah, build up the candle that we're burning at both ends because we, we, we are, you know, I think we discount, uh, we've almost uh, taken... Um, how, I don't know how we did this, but some some smart uh, smarter person than myself will, will probably has it figured out. But somehow, uh, do you notice that in North America that we seem to have taken we uh, almost wear like uh, as if it is a badge of honor to be sleep deprived? It's like oh, For you sure. know, uh, I, I only sleep four hours a night, and uh, so I can you know as if that's something to be proud of, uh, and um, so true. you know, and it's and instead of whereas over here. Um, you know, and it may be the other extreme. Um, over here, the idea is if you're doing well, uh, you take pride in sleeping, in, in not being rushed, and in not being, you know, run down. And uh, that's considered to be lower class. You know? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing that's kind of cool now is that there's some of these markers. There's even markers now that we, you know, might be coming out that show us in terms of people not getting enough sleep, these biological markers we can show people. Because, I mean, I work downtown Toronto, and it's the same way. People are kind of really busy, and they do have a good capacity to withstand stress, but they, you know, to get them, I used to ask people how stressed they were. And, of course, my first year of practice, over 500 people, I didn't have a single person tell me they were stressed. 
I said, well, wait a minute. You guys are waking up at five. You're hitting the gym. You got meetings all day, all these things. So I had to reframe the question with yes. kind of how busy are you, right? Because there you go. that same kind of sympathetic dominance. And so there's a lot of cool stuff coming out that we can actually sort of show people these metrics, these these markers and say, look, it's nice that you're sort of generally feeling well, but um, you know, you're, the biochemical wheels are turning pretty quick in the body there because you're working, your body's working hard. So let's do a few things, you know. And again, it always starts in that diet, exercise, lifestyle front. But let's do a few things to just help support you, right? Yeah, yeah, great point. Um, so let me let's see, doc, um, Dr. Bubs, Mark. Uh, should I call you Mark or Dr. Bubs? I didn't, I didn't really ask whatever, you before. Whatever works is great for me. No worries. <laughs> okay, well. Uh, how about now? Speaking of that, that's such a huge issue. You know, the stress and and, and the re, and sometimes people don't. Know, um, I think a, a lot of people don't know why it's so important. As far as uh, you know, metabolically speaking, uh, there's certainly many factors. You know, we get the cortisol boost, uh, and uh, there's a you know there's a limited capacity from uh, at least from from what I'm studying and reading and. Uh, and I'd love to have your view on this, but there's the view that, you know, we have a limited capacity for hormone, hormone production. And so when we ramp up our cortisol production through chronic stress, even low level chronic stress, we're sort of, you know, robbing Peter to pay Paul and that, res that sure. reserve of material to, to make uh, hormones, um, you know, is sort of depleted and, and might cause an imbalance uh, and uh, with other hormones. Would you agree? Would, how, would you think that's an accurate description? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think that's a really key one, and it's important to remember, I mean, cortisol's job is to break down body tissue, primarily muscle tissue, uh, to raise blood sugars to give us fuel. Um, now, this is a problem on a couple fronts because we know now from a lot of the research that lean muscle mass is one of the best predictors of your overall health and your longevity. So we don't want to be breaking down too much of it. Um, the other component is, like you said, and you see this classically in a lot of endurance athletes, um, is that the longer nature of their training, the higher volume of their training, they tend to have higher cortisol levels and they tend to then have lower testosterone levels yes. as well. It also drives down immunity because uh, like you said, they're coming from the same building block, cholesterol, right? That's the building block for all our hormones and it's one of the reasons why this you know, erroneous notion that we should all have lower than a certain number of cholesterol. I mean, if it's, if it's the building block for all of our hormones, if it's key uh, part of all the cellular membranes, which is where all the communication happens, then surely um, there isn't this sort of arbitrary number that we should be under. And we see, you know, there's a lot of nice studies with, you know, high-level athletes, Olympic athletes, and they show that, you know, when they're sort of run down and the testosterones are low and recovery is poor, et cetera, the ones who are fed higher fat diet, uh, in particular saturated fats, those are the athletes that then recover better and then perform better, right? So that was... Uh, a really key point and one of the reasons why, again, the animal proteins and the eggs and things can become, and all your fats, like you mentioned before with the butters, et cetera, can become a real powerful weapon uh, for people. Yeah, that's, that's such a key thing. Um, well, you know, let's, while, we're on, while we're talking about hormones, I noticed you have a, uh, a very, an interesting article about, uh, um, and I know our, the majority of our uh, listeners and viewers are, are males uh, sort of in, in, in the in the high, thir you know, th late thirties to uh, to early fifties range. So, of course, testosterone yep. is a, you know, the decline of testosterone seems sort of, um, you know, endemic uh, exactly. among modern males. Uh, it's something I've, you know, dealt with myself a couple of years ago. My testosterone uh, was at the level of a of a of a you know a grandparent uh, of a sixty nine year old man, and um, yep. um, I'm thankful to have uh, been able to reboot that and learned a whole bunch of stuff along the way. So I'm, um, you know, but uh, can talk to us about uh, how um, you know for men out there who want to uh, you know, to naturally boost their testosterone, what what are some things you would suggest? Yeah, I mean that's a really common one. Again, kind of working downtown. Um, you know, the busier people are, it can drive down testosterone levels as that cortisol goes up. But that's always what we're looking for is really this idea. If you have low testosterone, you know, the, the, the typical solution is just to apply a gel or a cream or a pill and raise the testosterone levels. You know, while that can be effective for some, it doesn't ever address the reason why the testosterone got low in the first place. And, and two of the main hormones, and again, we address both of these uh, in the Paleo Project, cortisol and insulin, that blood sugar hormone, are really key because yes. a couple of things happen. If you're gaining weight your insulin levels are likely higher and insulin then, when insulin levels are higher, you produce more androstenedione, which is a weaker form of testosterone. So you're not getting the same bang for your buck. Your, your belly fat's also going up, which is increasing aromatase, right? You're converting yes. more testosterone now to estrogen, uh, which is sort of, again, another double whammy here. 
If we combine that with a you know a person who's busy or not sleeping, we know that stress hormones are going up, and as cortisol goes up, then again you're pulling down um, testosterone levels. So there's a lot of what we call testosterone leaks, things like you know zinc levels, uh, absorption of, of of minerals like that uh, can play key roles. Uh, liver enzymes as well, you know, excessive alcohol intakes of various things can be more proestrogenic. So the idea is always to kind of look at the person's diet, et cetera, and see where the things are that are causing a lot of those foundational issues. So always getting someone's insulin and blood sugar and cortisol on point is kind of job one um, because then we're going to see a natural improvement in testosterone levels. And maybe that takes the person all the way back to where they need to be or maybe they do need a little more support after that. Um, but on the food side, like you said, all these, these saturated fats become extremely, extremely important. And that's where you know, people who tend to have lower cholesterol, we often see in clinical practice, will have lower you know, uh, testosterone levels as well. So that's where getting that buy-in from the person to increase uh, you know, the butter or the coconut oil or the animal fats um, is, is important. And normally their, their first question is, well, what about my cholesterol levels or what about my saturated fat levels, right? Because we're so conditioned to have those things be associated with cardiovascular disease, but really, you know, if we can get the belly fat down and get the person leaner and increase the muscle mass and then put the building blocks in the diet, in particular those saturated fats, to help build the actual hormones, then those levels come back pretty nicely. Yeah, well, great explanation. And, uh, and I think people should uh, can take note of that because uh, um, there is a, um, you know, obviously, I don't, um, you know, in the States, We've, we're just bombarded by pharmaceutical advertising, and, uh, and hey, I'm not I'm not anti pharmaceutical per se, but but uh, I think we both agree Absolutely. that they lifestyle should be, you know, the lifestyle should be the the, the first uh, thing that you do, and uh, and it's much and if you uh, if you can reboot your own system, why wouldn't you do that, you know, before you start introducing, you know, a synthetic uh, version of the hormone, um, and um, so uh, wow, well, for sure, I mean, that's where. That's where if, when you pair that with some strength training, I mean, there's nothing better for testosterone levels than to perform movements like compound movements like squats and deadlifts and you know, even Olympic lifts as well are f fantastic. So if the person's already athletic, they can kind of gear themselves up and start increasing the load uh, on the bar. Uh, that's where some volume work too can be really good. We talk about that in the performance chapter there, chapter 10 of, of my book, of how increasing that volume can really help. But even for the average person, just some body weight squats, if the person's very overweight, you know, a body weight squat could be 250 pounds, 270 pounds of, of effort, right? So that, that yes. in itself is, is, is pretty good. Um, and of course, on that endurance training side, cardiovascular side, this is really cool where we see a lot of the research now. Most people, when they're trying to lose weight, would, would add more endurance training, right? More 45, 60-minute bouts to try to burn fat. But when we look at these, you know, that HIT training, that high-intensity interval training, um, we're seeing 30-second bouts, four or five rounds, and we're seeing the same metabolic benefits, uh, fat-burning benefits, VO2 max, as we see with longer bouts. So it's really great that you can be more efficient with what you're doing, right? You don't have to be training for as long, and you can actually get more bang for your buck. So that's always a yeah, a, yeah, a that's comp, uh, right? uh, that's that's so important, you know, because uh, one of the biggest. Um, um, I think, you know, there's so many, so many reasons, so many excuses that we can come up with not to, uh, you know, not to exercise. And the chief one, uh, from my experience is probably lack of time. And, uh, yeah. and so what you're, what you're saying, you're talking, the research that you're talking about is wonderful. It's showing, you know, the, that the, with the greater intensity and doing the, the interval training that we can do, we can get a, a great benefit from a lot less time. Is that right? Absolutely. I mean, it even comes back to just this sense of play for a lot of people. I mean, when I ask some clients, like, when was the last time you ran as fast as you could? I mean, some people have to go back 10, 20 years to figure out when they actually just ran as fast as they could, right? Oh, yeah. And so that's where, you know, you get people to start slow, but I mean, pacing off, you know, 50 meters or 50 yards in a park and, and doing a couple of repeats. And of course, you just, you, you run as fast as, as you feel comfortable with initially. But I mean, and as little as five or six minutes, and of course, if you have kids or anything else, it's a, you know you can you can make that into games or whatever else. But it's it's amazing how you don't need as much as you think you need. And the nice part is, as your training age increases, the more years you've been training, you can actually really get away with a lot less. So you you get this kind of payoff uh, for for that compliancy. Yeah. So as far as maintenance being easier than uh, than getting getting to a baseline, is that what you, is that what you mean? Yeah, there's that maintenance factor, but then there's just the factor if you've been lifting weights for 5 or 10 or 15 years, you don't need as much time in the gym as you did when you first started in those first couple of years because neurologically, all those adaptations, there's a lot of 
groundwork that's already been laid there. So it's more about that efficiency and kind of getting the right um, stressors on on the systems versus just kind of logging these. You know, some guys will still do four or five days a week for an hour each session, um, and that's great if you enjoy it. But for the people who say, "Well, I don't have time for that," you know, we we can figure out ways around that in terms of fifteen twenty minutes. You know, two or three times a week, that type of thing to really, you know, increase the fat burning, build lean muscle. And then you get the improvements in cognitive function. People start to, to think better and, and feel better. And, of course, that's when you get the ball rolling in the right direction and people are obviously more compliant at that point. Yeah, that's, you know, that's, that is uh, something that, that many, many years ago uh, as a young guy, I was, uh, uh, like a lot of people, uh, started reading uh, as a teenager, reading some of the, the fitness magazines. And, it was the, uh, and, and I ran across uh, a book by, by uh, the, the inventor, the founder of Nautilus, Arthur Jones. And uh, he was really, way, I, think, I guess, ahead of his time, perhaps. You know, he was already on to the high intensity, low, very low volume, you know, perhaps one set, uh, but take, you know, two failure and, you know, yep. p- positive failure, negative failure in certain cases. Uh, uh, what do you, what, what is your, what is your feeling on, on that, uh, on, on that area as far as strength training goes with volume? I mean, I think the biggest key with the strength training is again, like training density, which is the amount of work you do in a given time is a really nice way to do it because you can give someone 15 minutes and tell them to do a series of exercises, let's say it's squats and and chest press for push-ups and planks, and you're just trying to see how many rounds they can get in in that 15 minutes. So they're trying to become, you know, reduce the rest periods, etc. That's a really great way of getting training up. The other is training intensity. And the, the cool part is this doesn't always have to be the weight on the bar. Now, as the weight gets heavier, of course, the intensity goes up. Um, and it's one of the reasons why you know, Olympic lifting, or even when we see a lot of the CrossFit crowds, there's a lot of benefit there. But it's very cool because in elderly populations, we see intensity as just the point at which they can no longer maintain perfect form. Right. So for somebody who's 75 or 80, again, building, you know, strength training is really key. It's great for health and longevity. And they don't need to add, you know, a lot of weight. They just need to perform the movements to their own, you know, failure. And what people forget is that, you know, even hip fractures are obviously very common in this population and and when you, if you're going to fall over it's your fast twitch muscles which prevent you from falling over and of course in elderly populations if we do some strength training we're training up those fibers that would help the person then catch themselves before they fall right which is something that's often overlooked and something as basic as you know some body weight squats etc would be the thing that would, would help that person yeah yeah that's you know i i think i saw a study years ago that um mentioning that as a catalyst for decline, there was perhaps nothing more common than, uh, you know, an elderly person falling and breaking the hip. And that uh, oftentimes yeah. after that, uh, many, uh, many of the, you know, many of our elderly people don't, don't get enough physical therapy. They don't, you know, they don't uh, get the attention they need or they don't take advantage of the attention that they get. And, uh, and many of them, you know, are, are then in, becoming much more sedentary and, uh, you know, lose their mobility totally. And it's, uh, it doesn't have to be that way. Exactly. I mean, it's one of those things where once a bit of pain sets in or you have an injury, then things can really, it's sort of a use it or lose it where the less you move, then the more the pain syndrome can come in and it really, the downward spiral happens and happen quite quickly. So it's, yeah, the more you can keep people moving, walking, et cetera. And of course, if you're already into training or the more intensely you're into training, that's where, you know, adding that intensity or, or, or really dialing into, you know, your lifts in terms of those deadlifts or overhead squats, et cetera, to kind of see what your percentages are. But there's, there's, a, there's an area in there for everyone, which is kind of the cool part. Yeah, wonderful. Well, Mark, let's change gears just briefly. Um, for people out there, I find uh, that it's oftentimes helpful if we could um, – if you could share uh, perhaps, you know, kind of a case study, uh, you know, maybe an imaginary case study just to walk people, imagining, you know, for someone out there who's, who's an ex-athlete, uh, maybe it's been, you know, 15, 20 years, they're sedentary now, but they'd like to, uh, there's, they'd like to get, you know, get in shape again. They'd like to look better, feel better, perform better. Um, what would be, uh, what, what would be, you know, if you were sort of, you know, someone calls you with that, uh, that scenario, um, and, uh, and said, listen, I've got, uh, sure. you know, I've got the, I've got a, I've got a, I want to p- kind of peak, uh, in July because we're going on vacation with the family and want to look good. Yep. Uh, and then I want to keep it up. Um, what would be some, some things that you might suggest? 
And that's where normally, I mean, it, we get that question a lot, especially, uh, you know, people, people working downtown and all of a sudden they realize the trip's coming up in three or four weeks and they want to, you know, get that overhaul going. Um, and this is where even when they come in, they tell me, well, I don't have any real problems. I just want to upgrade things. And as you go through, you know, their health history and you go through digestion, you realize that there might be, okay, there might be some heartburn uh, or there's gas and bloating, you know, just pretty constantly. Um, you might also find that there is this nagging joint pain and inflammation and things like that. So it starts to paint this picture because um, we know now, you know, if the belly fat's up a little bit, things like dysbiosis is going to be there. So yes. that builds up a bad bacteria. Uh, we know that inflammation is going to be up as well, right? So this is kind of the cool part because the person normally comes in to just, they just want to look better, but we can help them look better as well as improving all these health parameters as well, right? Sure. Um, so that's what normally, again, we, we would start to, to titrate down the carbohydrates in the diet, um, the amount of carbs, especially if it's in that three or four week range. Um, you know, a low carb diet uh, quantified as about 100 grams of carbs. So you, you, you get that person to really start increasing their protein intake, increasing their fat intake, increasing their veggies. And for the most part, when I'm starting out, I don't give anybody any amounts. I just say, eat, as, eat until you're full with all those foods. Okay? Sure. And it's those carbohydrates that then we start to, to reduce um, because sometimes people don't realize how much they can be getting in in a day. I mean, making a, a smoothie is a great thing to do in the morning, a protein shake. But if you're putting you know, a banana and a half and a full cup of berries and and this and juice and everything else, people don't realize they're getting 80 to 100 grams of carbs in just their morning shake oh, that they're yeah. making. Um, so we walk them through that in terms of, of dialing in that nutrition piece. And the nice part is around that, once we have some weight loss and that belly fat's coming down, we know that the gut microbiome is going to be improving. Um, things like leaky gut, which can be present, that immune system is going to be improving, and that inflammatory response as well. So um, that's when people tend to, they lose the weight, they start feeling better, and then all of a sudden, you know, they start feeling better and thinking better and then it becomes an easy buy-in for sort of this lifestyle change because they think to themselves, well, wait a minute, I didn't do a major overhaul. I just tweaked my meals here and there and all of a sudden I got these, you know, quite a big bang for my buck here. So so, so why is that? They always think there has to be some major, major buy-in but it's, it's kind of, it's quite cool when they can just do some small tweaks and get to that body composition or at least get to that point where they feel like they're looking good for their holiday and then after that in the back end we can, you know, keep upgrading for them. Yeah, well, that's I think I think you just touched on something that um, that intersects with uh, behavioral psychology and uh, and with wellness coaching. That's uh, I think one of the key things uh, that I sort of stumbled upon, and I'm sure many other people have as well. And that is is the getting uh, getting getting a customer, um, getting a patient, getting them results, and uh, and then also sometimes it's also about helping them understand you know, what the, to interpret that result because uh, sometimes people have, um, uh, fault, you know, expectations that are just, uh, you know, sort of like, um, you know, the, we have the get rich quick, uh, you know, mentality that sells a lot of, you yeah. know, bogus programs. And then there's the get fit quick program. Sure. I tend to see those on the same, you know, the same way of scamming people. But, uh, but you sure. know, uh, uh, what's your, what, uh, so if, if you were, if I was going to ask you, you know, apart from what you just said, is there any, uh, if I wanted to, uh, to get, um, you know, if you have this, this, this typical guy, this 40 something ex jock, uh, sedentary yep. now for 10 years and you, and, and his wife called you and she says, listen, Mark, um, I know that, uh, you know, my husband, he's, uh, he's very busy, um, and he thinks it's all, you know, just he needs to exercise more and eat less, and I know that that's not the case. Yep. Can you win him over? What can, can you, what, what's the simplest thing you can do to get his attention? The, the simplest thing to do is just tell him, look, the brec you know, let's start with breakfast. Eat the bacon and eggs. Let's add some avocado or some green veggies in there. And all I'm going to do is just take away your toast and your potatoes and your orange juice and all the other carbs. And most of the time, guys will think, well, geez, I'm still eating some of the stuff that tastes pretty good. So, you know, that's kind of acceptable. We might move to lunch. And if lunch he's having some pasta or some rice, we say, look, have the fish, have the steak, have the, the chicken. Put that on a nice salad. Again, the fats, things like the olive oil thing that give us that taste yeah. um, and make meals taste nice. Go for it. Add that on, right? So, again, the, the buy-in seems like, well, wait a minute. He's not asking me to do too much here. I think that can... That can help. And of course, the X factor a lot of times, and this is where it can be nice if they're going on a trip, is the alcohol intake because, you know, a little bit of alcohol can be beneficial, but sometimes on the back end, especially 
guys who are, are busy with clients and meetings and stuff can be having you know that that glass of wine turns into the whole bottle. Oh yeah. So that's, sometimes if you can if you can cut that back for that period of time, then that'll really help as well. But uh, just getting those carbs down, get those proteins up, get the veggies up, and again, when there's no calorie counting, when there's no portion size counting, it becomes a lot easier because we just say you know in terms of protein intake for guys, we say at least one and a half of the size of your palm. Right. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that's very simple. On the plate, right? So, and I work with guys from uh, who play on the men's Olympic basketball team in Canada basketball. These are six foot ten guys. They got big palms. Oh so yeah. When we eat, when we eat at training camp, and we've got the Pan Am Games coming up here in Toronto, and the Olympic qualifiers on the back end of that, we got to make sure that there's a good portion there on the plate oh, to, to meet their needs, right? Yeah, that's fascinating. Well, you know, that's something else I bet I'm sure people are curious about. Can you share any uh, any any anecdotes of uh, you know of you know of, of an athlete of an athlete that improved his performance based on you know doing some of these strategies with you. I think it happens across the board, and I mean, oftentimes we think um, you know that elite or professional athletes have everything completely dialed in, and while you know the stresses and the strains of competitive seasons and everything else take a lot of toll on them. So even doesn't matter what level you're at, we're always just trying to upgrade the person's diet for them, right? That's the kind of the biggest key because. You know, most of these guys will eat well, but then where do we find these 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 little moments in terms of whether it's the protein intake or whether it's the amount of fats they're consuming or whether they're for some they might need some extra caffeine, for others they might be pushing that caffeine system a little too hard and having you know too many coffees through the day, struggling with sleep, things like that. So, what really amazed me has always been just the simplicity of the of the interventions for even elite athletes and how dramatic the impacts can be for them and if. The simple interventions are really effective for them, then surely for the rest of us, sure. they're going to have a pretty big bang for their buck as well, right? Yeah, yeah, no question, no question. Wow, Mark, the time is flying by. I could, uh, could go for another hour here with you, but I want to be respectful of your time uh, as well. So I think we should probably start to kind of wrap things up here. Um, no problem. Thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah, it's been a great pleasure. Uh, you know, what I usually like to finish with is, um, is I sort of ask people a version of the same question, which, uh, you know, beyond, uh, beyond what we've talked about, um, is, what would, is there anything else that you would, uh, that you would like to, uh, that you would add as far as a strategy, you know, a high-impact uh, strategy that's, uh, that's, that gives a lot of results and that's yet also sort of simple to, uh, to understand and, and uh, and implement. It's just always about trying to find that the make things as simple as you can. If you don't have time to train, do body weight squats and alternate it with push ups. Flip flop that for ten minutes, and I guarantee you, you, you will you'll feel the benefits. We have one where we even do burpees. You set a timer for seven minutes, see how many you can do. After the first two minutes, you'll be exhausted. Of course, all these things need to be done as long as you don't have any pain syndromes, etc. But you're always looking for the simplest approach. Try to find those periods of time, 10, 15 minutes. Get a couple of days of working out in a week if you can. If you can't, add more of that walking in. Right? Walking can be a tremendous right. tool as well. If you're too busy, go for your coffee break three blocks over and then walk back to the office rather than just going you know, down to the, uh, the local one there. And the same idea on the food front. Just get back to eating more real food. Put down the processed stuff. Um, get those proteins and fats and veggies up. Start bumping those carbs down. And it's amazing how just with that, um, and we go through all of that in the book in terms of benchmarks, et cetera, if you want a kind of a fuller explanation. But uh, just those things, you'll, people will see, they do see, you know, great improvements in energy and productivity in the gym and in the office and things like that. Wow, wonderful stuff. You're a wealth of, uh, got a wealth of information for people. And uh, uh, so, Mark, if uh, for people out there who might want to consult with you, um, what's the, uh, the best way to find you? And, uh, and do you do uh, uh, also... Con- online consult or, or phone consults as well? Yeah, so drbubs.com, D-R-B-U-B-B-S, drbubs.com is where you can find uh, my main website. The book website is called paleoprojectbook.com. Uh, and we've got our book tour dates there as well. We'll be in Canada and the U.S. and over in the U.K. as well, so people could check that out. And we do do remote visits and Skype consults as well, so no matter uh, you know, where you're at, you can, you can drop us a line and there's uh, some room in there to let us know what your concerns are and uh, definitely find some time to, uh, to help people out. Well, wow, fantastic stuff. So uh, once again, thanks for coming on the show. This is uh, great information, Dr. Mark Bobbs, 
and uh, highly suggest you guys check out his, his information. You've got a, just looking at your blog articles now and uh, wonderful, a lot of cool stuff. Just, I've got a couple of ideas that uh, I'm going to use to, because I've got to do some writing this weekend. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, and that and that ebook's available too on Amazon and iBook and Kindle and all those things as well. So they can just type in Paleo Project book and find it on all those uh, electronic mediums as well. Wonderful. And and by the way, when did your when did your book launch? Was that just in the last month? It was or? Just in the last month. Yeah, start of March. We had a great uh, launch here in Toronto and raised some money for a local charity. So it was uh, a lot of fun. Very well received. And uh, yeah, looking forward to uh, to talking about it and promoting it this year. Yeah, and uh, and so. Uh, and do you have your dates for your London visit? We don't have our dates for our London visit yet, but they will be coming up um, on that paleoprojectbook.com website. You'll see there's the, a book tour section there, and we'll be adding some dates as we go. Uh, we just added a few in 